welcome to the podcast. This is exciting. Hi. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm excited to have you because uh, you and I were on a call, I think it was last week only, and we were talking about your career and music, and we decided that we should try to record a podcast where we do some talking and you do some playing with the intention of talking about music from a place that is alive for you. And I was just wondering if you could share with me and people who are listening right now, what is it that is alive in you when it comes to music and that what you're doing? Yeah, um, there's something that's particular about playing or people that you kind of feel like you lock into this river that's always been flowing of like emotion and thought and hope and um that's what becomes alive in me the feeling of connectedness when i'm playing <laughs> yeah can you can you give us a, a brief history of how you arrived where you are today as a musician and a teacher and what it is that you're currently doing now that is bringing these things up for you yeah for sure so i actually started in public school system what it, it would have been third grade and um, I originally wanted to play violin, but they didn't have enough. And I was a pretty tall kid, so they told me to grab the cello, and I fell in love with it. Uh, but my family doesn't have a big background in music, so we didn't know anything about, you know, lessons and summer festivals and all these things that you're supposed to do. Um, so I just really had fun with it for the most part. Um, and then it got to high school, and I started thinking, you know, about what I'd like to do with my life. And the only thing that felt natural was pursuing a career in music. It's it's the thing that always brought me closer to people, the thing that made me friends, and kind of where I felt accepted in the space. Um, and that was interesting because as soon as I got into conservatory for undergrad, um, all of that kind of changed, right? Because it was a completely new environment, um, people from very different backgrounds that I was from, no one really that looked like me. So it took a while for me to divorce myself from trying to find my identity in music and realizing that I have an identity that's separate from it music so that came about a couple of different ways i uh at the same time that i was doing music it was kind of paradoxical that i was trying to push it away and i joined the rowing team at the university and that kind of taught me so much about why i like music and i realized i'm obsessed with the practice i'm obsessed with learning i'm obsessed with the physicality of it and um everything else was kind of secondary so finished that uh went back home to do uh, another degree and that's when coronavirus hit. So kind of all of us musicians had to start thinking about if this lasts longer than it has, like, what are we going to do? Um, so I played around a lot with, you know, doing concerts online and uh, kind of talking through some music and then playing. But um, it didn't really amount to much because as soon as the schools opened back up, I was like, I need to go back to school. And uh, now I'm pursuing a master's in cello performance. And uh, some things, like you said, are coming up about where do I fit in this whole thing? Yeah, this uh, this idea of, of um, finding your identity in uh, music is is an interesting one. And I'm I'm curious, what was it about rowing and you joining the rowing team and the physicality of that that made you realize that what you enjoyed the most was the practice? Was there just an epiphany, uh, or was it something that was more subtle than that? Uh, what what was it? Can you articulate that? Yeah, so um, I think one of the biggest things is that like it was the thing I did in the morning every day when I woke up. So the first part was having that discipline of like, okay, there's people counting on me, I have to show up, right? And then music, that was the same. And then once I started looking at them as not separate, but maybe two things that are coming together, I realized that all of my coaches and my teachers were speaking different languages, but getting at the same concepts, which is like relaxation, you know, technique is in between movements not during the events and um as i got more and more into each of the disciplines i realized they're pretty similar yeah 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 no doubt about it it's it, it's uh it's fascinating i i can't really play an instrument for the life of me i mean i can play a little piano a little guitar but i, I you know, don't don't tell me to, or don't ask me to to play a full song or or to even know what the notes that i'm playing are but I'm, I'm fascinated by people who speak the language of music. And something that you and I were talking about last week was the connection to music and specifically classical. 
Why classical for you? You know, when I was little, uh, my grandma used to play a lot of classical music in the house, and um, I was really close to her. And uh, I just grew up listening to it through her, even though she didn't play any instruments or have any real like knowledge, you could say, of, of, of the field. But um, I always just liked it. it. It spoke to me differently than other music did because there was space there. There was space for me to not perceive, but just sit, you know? Um, and that kind of stuck with, with me the whole time. And then the other thing I really liked about it was just having to carry around this big instrument. I just, I just thought it was fun. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I would think it would be the opposite that you had to carry it around because it's a pretty big, uh, instrument. How, how much does a cello weigh on average? Um, this was probably 12, 13 pounds. And then the case is another pound. Yeah. Or two. Okay. Yeah. So you're, 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 you're carrying around 14 pounds uh, of weight and you've been doing that since uh what year seven or eight yeah <laughs> okay so it's been a while anyways uh, you, you're also going to play us uh, a few pieces I, I think this may lead into you playing uh and sharing your first piece with us um yeah give us a little introduction and um and feel free to dive in when you're ready sure um i guess first i'll play a piece called julio by mark summers um, it's pretty contemporary. Uh, I was written in 1988 and I just kind of want to play something that's maybe a little bit more accessible, more followable. And then I guess we could just chat about it afterwards. Yeah. But, Sounds um, like a plan. Sounds like a plan. Uh, you can actually keep the phone close to you. It, if, if, if it doesn't bother you and get in your way, there you go. Sorry, I needed to have my pedal to change the page. Don't have it. Ready. <laughs> it's fine. It, it's fine. It, it, I I was I was loving it, but this is great, and I think I think this this moment is perfect because one of the things that we were talking about, and I think everybody listening uh, struggles with, is this idea of perfection, uh, having everything ready to be able to pull the trigger on 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 certain uh, things they want to try to express and the need for perfect preparation leads to failure for the lack of doing. And I, I love this. So go, do your thing. Uh, fix whatever you have to fix and be ready. And, and we can dive in again because I, I, I could listen to this uh, 20 times. All right. Round two. Pedal this time. Thank you. 
<laughs> Man. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. Yeah, Amazing. It, yeah. It's a it's it's a little scary, you know, to just kind of play in this kind of space. Um, you know, we're so used to having, you know, the dedicated performance venue and you know the time before and there's like silence when you come on stage and then you sit and there's like this focus, but um it's 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 a little scary, but also much it's exciting too to play in this kind of space that we're in right now. Yeah, no, I feel I feel that, and it feels very intimate because it's just you and me here talking and you playing, and um, it's not like you've been rehearsing this thing that we're doing right now. So it feels very special to me, and I can't put my fingers on what it is, but I can say that I one connected to the music. Two, watching you do your thing and now having known you for a little bit made me see a part of you and a side of you that I'd never seen before and I became even more curious about you. And three, I would say that now I want to know more. I, I want to know why Why did you choose that piece? I, I loved it. Uh, I'd never heard it before. I thought it was cool. And something that came up for me was uh, my grandson. He loves music. We have a guitar here, and he he likes to play and mess around with it. And anytime he hears um, music on the TV or somebody playing, he he starts to dance. And I I felt this deep need to want to play this piece for him uh, as you were as you were sharing it. Um, yeah, pretty special. So <laughs> a lot. Anyways, why why did you choose this piece, and why do I love it? Yeah, uh, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with the rhythm. So I, uh, a lot, you know, when we think of classical music, we're really thinking of kind of this German tradition of music that, um, for a lot of different reasons, put a lot more focus on harmony and on melody than it did on rhythm, right? So I wanted to pick a piece that would connect to us a little bit more because we're more versed in the language of rhythm today than we are you know, harming like people that were listening to classical music originally would have been. So I wanted to pick something that would feel closer to home, yet still be on the instrument and uh, still get us in that space of familiarity, but still something new and and see what came up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talk to me about rhythm versus melody and harmony, like you were saying. What is it about rhythm or, yeah, what is it about rhythm in regards to music today? Um that is different than it was and makes us feel more connected? Is it simply exposure or is it something else? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you think about it, your heartbeat, right? It's a constant pulse that you have. So we have this kind of biological and spiritual connection to pulse, right? To feeling the organization of time. Um, and, you know, traditions of Africa, uh, you know, the Middle East, um, Traditions in the U.S., especially around like the 1900s, they put a lot of emphasis on rhythm as a mo as a mode of expression, right? And um, a lot of these musics have started to influence popular music, starting around like disco, 1970, that area. So our ears are just so used to latching onto rhythm and lyrics too. Uh, that that's why I, I think at least that's why we can connect a little bit more to a piece that has rhythmic interests. Something that you you made me think of was the importance of rhythm in physical performance. So, I mean, rowing, for example, in gymnastics. When you when I walk into a gymnastics gym, I don't even have to look at what somebody is doing just from the rhythm of how they're moving. And me, uh, like say they're doing a tumbling pass on the floor, I can tell to some degree what what they are doing just through the rhythm. So there's a lot of uh, information that comes from that and proper rhythm being on beat, so to speak, uh, gives you more output. And this is something that I'm, I'm very curious about, uh, how to develop is it, how do you develop it as a musician? Yeah. Um, so it, I'll say it was my weak point for a long time. And it's still something that I work on a lot is having pulse. Um, and 
you know, the biggest thing that helped me was to expose myself to different kinds of music. So uh, while being here at school, I've been, you know, playing uh, rhythmic percussive instruments from Persian traditions and playing Chinese music and Java, Javanese music and um, just trying to get myself used to different types of feeling the organization of time in rhythm, right? So I think exposing myself to different forms and then, you know, the good old metronome where you just like set a beat and you just like, like chopping wood, just work and work and work until it irons itself out sort of thing. And, you know, a, a big one too is um, feeling that like the events are all marked by smaller events, right? So you can feel that there's two posts, right? You'd say maybe your first count and your second count, but there's so many ways to feel that space in between. And I think the more emotional or interpretive connection you have to that connection, to that connection between the notes, um, the easier it is to be in that. Mm, I like I like that idea. Very beautiful. Abe, do you want to play us your second piece? Sure. Um, we'll shift back about 200 years. <laughs> um, composer, some people might know Bach. Uh, he wrote a lot of unaccompanied music for cello, kind of the first person to do that for us.
Wow. Yet very different piece, uh, a lot of contrast, and I love it. And as you started playing, immediately my my brain went to the logical side of trying to tell a story around this before I allowed myself to let go and actually listen, which was interesting because the 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 the, the logic that was coming up in my brain was around. Uh, what is it that we're trying to say here with this piece? And immediately I was thinking about, uh, you know, entering a cafe or a restaurant or a- any any venue and thinking about uh, what's playing on the radio, basically. What's, what's, what's coming through the loudspeakers? And some cafes maybe have a mood, right? And they, they, they may play some classical, but it, the volume would be very low and it wouldn't be what... Um, sets the tone, so to speak. Just, this is just my my observation, and I may be completely wrong. And uh, it, something that that came up for me was this idea of it being outdated. But as soon as I allowed myself to l- listen to you, I, I realized that I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Can you relate to that statement? A hundred percent. Yeah. And it's it's something I've been, you know, wrestling with myself too, is I, I realize that a lot of kind of the resistance to classical music is because it's been over intellectualized. I feel like that's not just classical music, but that's most art. Uh from this, you know, this postmodern perspective of like everything has to mean something. And and we've gotten away from just being and just feeling. And like you said, allowing yourself to just listen, you know? and not try to assign meaning or value to, to what's happening. And that's kind of what I'd like to do in the future is find ways to expose people to music in that, in that, in that space and in that way of just be, and, and letting the music bring the stuff up for you, you know? Um, because if you think about it, our early relationship to music was spiritual and religious. And, um, the more we've, kind of developed it and, and, and intellectualized it, I think we've lost a big part of that, of just allowing the mystery of it to, to impress something or to bring something or to remind us. Yeah. What does this piece remind you of? Yeah, so part of the reason I picked this one too is I've been playing this piece pretty much my whole life um, in a bunch of different contexts, different periods of my life, and you know, for a long time, I tried to have that same interpretation of it where I was telling a story or I was evoking some sort of mood. But uh, I guess just having played it so many times at this point now, it's just more about improvising and letting the music speak to me in different ways. So um, I don't play it the same anymore. I try not to practice it too much either because I like having that that space to do it. I mean, it it, it kind of does, and it, and it leads to you know I can go down a few rabbit holes with it, but l- let's just talk about the the physical side of how you performed it. This is not something that you've been practicing uh, a lot lately. It's not something that you rehearsed. You've done it your whole life, so it's kind of there, um, which allows you to record. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, it allows you to just uh, let it rip. Uh, and and something that I was just thinking about is is when you start playing your your face changes, <laughs> right? You you become it's like you enter this zone, and I was just uh, noticing how you were moving in um, conjunction with how you're breathing. Is this something that you're even thinking about, or did you think about it before? Yeah, what's what's that technical side of of your approach? Yeah, so I was pretty big into yoga for a while too. And um, I realized in this kind of epiphany that all of these physical practices I was, I was doing that, it's all connected. I realized that the breath is so underrated. Learning how to control your breath and time your breath and have rhythm. I mean, you get you know eight guys in a boat and if they're all breathing at the same cadence, they're gonna be rowing together, right? So I realized also that like my breath tells me so much about my physical state. If I'm not breathing correctly, I'm tense. If I'm tense, I'm not going to shift well. I'm going to play out of tune. If I do that, it's going to be a negative feedback loop. I'm going to be like, this sounds like shit. But you, you, can, you, can, you can swear, yeah. <laughs> it just So it's like this loop, right? And I feel like if I remember to just go back to the breath, it simplifies everything. 
Yeah, and I think that's that's you being the instrument, playing the instrument, and utilizing the most uh, subtle of movements, which is your breath, to position your body in a way that it can execute playing. Are, are you thinking about something while you're playing, or is it just the music and you and there is no thought? When it's going really well, I like black out. I don't really remember what's happening. I'll remember like a couple things, you know, um, but a lot of the times I'm not playing by myself and what it ends up being is kind of this like crazy, th I wouldn't really know how to explain it in words, but when you're playing with someone that like, you guys get it in the same way, it's just like, you're not yourself anymore. And you just like, not only do your sounds come together, but like, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but when it's going really well, I'm, I'm not thinking, I'm just feeling. Um, but of course that's not all the time. Um, sometimes I am thinking, you know, if it's a piece that is newer to me or I haven't rehearsed as much, I have to really focus on certain sections that I know that there's certain technical things that aren't super ingrained in me. So I just pick one or two things to focus on. And, uh, one thing that I try to do is always think ahead a couple of things. So I'm never, I'm never in the space that you're hearing, whether it's that I'm gone or it's that I'm looking ahead or I'm just thinking about a particular technical aspect that's coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's that's a very interesting point. So, you this one you probably don't have to even read the music. You can just play it because you know it. But when you're when you're reading music, you're probably a few notes at least ahead. Uh, and then at the same time, you have to position yourself for whatever transition may be coming or whatever technical expression. How do you prioritize those those things? What comes first? Is it the technical? Is it the reading? Is it the playing? Uh, yeah, is there a sequence of events that you, you focus on? You grow up hearing music before technique, music before technique. And that just never sat well with me because I might have this amazing idea I want to do, but if I don't have the tools to do it, how, how am I going to make that happen? So also because, you know, I didn't have lessons and I started kind of late, um, I, for a long time, had this feeling of being behind technically. So for a lot of my practice, my life practicing, um, it's always been technique first for me. And then that also goes into, I just like the physicality and the repetition of, of the work. And it wasn't until recently, actually, that I took a pretty long break from practicing. And um, it was the first time in my life I did that. And I came back to the instrument and it was like, playing for the first time again. And I realized like, you know, I have done that technical work and now it's time to prioritize other things. Um, and it's kind of this process of constantly, you know, second guessing yourself or reminding yourself that like you've done the work. So sit in it, be proud and prioritize the musicality. So now I'm more interested in what the music is doing for other people when they're listening. That's my biggest focus when I'm preparing. Of huh. course, a couple of times something weird will happen and I'll have to iron it out, go through the progression, but yeah. In terms of musicality and looking at classical, does this piece serve as a foundation for that which is more contemporary or is it like a completely different lane when you look at, um, yeah, a newer piece within the classical space? The piece I just played or the first one? Yeah, like the piece that you just played, does that serve as a foundation for the first piece or is the first piece part of a, a completely separate lane within classical music? I guess the tradition of playing by yourself is pretty new, honestly. Um, uh, so a lot of these solo cello pieces, you know, just for cello, are all inspired in this vein of like having just one instrument play through the piece because our history is a collaborative instrument. Um, so in that sense, there's kind of a teleology in there where there's been this progression to that. But um, in terms of kind of the language being used, it's, it's very different. Um, you notice in the first piece, I had certain things like, like pizzicato, um, more complicated rhythms, and kind of the language that Bach is using is is completely different in that sense. So there's some similarities and some some differences. And that kind of also references technique and approach to playing the instrument versus the the composing of a piece, which is a completely different world. And maybe we can dive into that uh, after you play your your next piece here. Uh, so yeah, are you are you ready for your your next one? Sure. This is so cool. <laughs>
I'm having fun. Good. I'm so glad. Uh, just you know, it's 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 hanging out and 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 sharing uh, what you do, and I'm I'm just grateful I get to experience this. I'm I'm like, whoa! I'm I'm sitting at home right now, doing this thing that's supposedly work, and I feel like I'm being treated with this private concert. <laughs> it's, it's insane. <laughs> Man, you're killing me. Um, very, very, very special. You know, you, you, I, I was so excited earlier. I, I interrupted you, and I didn't allow you to share uh, who this was by and um, what the piece was. <laughs> so maybe we could just rewind to that moment. Uh, yeah, tell me, tell me about this piece. Yeah, it's my favorite composer, uh, Rachmaninoff, um, from the late Romantic period in Russia. Um, Pretty much right before World War One, I uh, when he was writing music, he's a really interesting guy, and I uh, relate to his story a lot. Um, he was born in a pretty wealthy family, but his father and his sister died. Uh, no, his father got really sick, and his sister died. And um, he was a prodigy, but as he got older, his dad gambled away all the money, and uh, he became like pretty depressed. And he always loved composing, but. Um, at the premiere of one of his first big pieces, the conductor apparently was drunk and the orchestra wasn't prepared and it went really poorly. And apparently he just like ran out of the theater and was like wandering the streets the whole night. 
and for three years he didn't pick up the pen again to write any music and he went to a uh, hypnotist psychologist kind of you know all that stuff was coming up during this time um and he got back to writing music and um i don't know his music just speaks to me in a way that no other composer does and this is an excerpt from a sonata with piano so typically it's played with someone else on the piano and it's a really special piece i recommend people if they kind of felt like he was saying something to them to listen to the whole I, something that was coming up for me just as you were playing was uh, my, my grandfather passed away a few years ago. And uh, the, the last time I saw him, I, I saw him because I had a delay um, with one of my flights and I had time to just leave the airport, go see him for a minute and then come back. And, uh, and, and one of the things that I never got to do with my, my grandfather was going to... Uh, concerts he, he used to go to these classical music concerts every couple weeks and uh, you know he would jump on the train and go into the city in Stockholm Sweden and um, I know that's how my cousins got to go with him but I, I never did and there was something about uh, you playing this piece right now that uh, made me feel like I was there with them so you you brought me back to that relationship through this piece and um i don't know that pretty pretty emotional if you ask me uh so thank you for that um tell me about uh this piece in particular does this have a a, a particular message that the composer was trying to share or is it something that's just open for interpretation and if so w what is your interpretation of it kind of in the history of music by this time um, we weren't really interested anymore in like storytelling through the music unless it was an opera. So especially this is in the vein of like what's called chamber music. So typically this kind of music where it's like for duo would be played in smaller intimate settings. And it's more about exploring harmony and melody. So uh, there's no real like program associated with this music, but um, I think it's just about Every, like it's just about human being human you know each each movement is a little different but still the same in that the the, the lines are beautiful whether they're sad or happy excited it's still beautiful and that, that that's what this piece means to me it's just it just reminds me what it is to be human and tells me it's okay to feel you know like how many times in our lives if you listen to this in a concert how many times are you sitting silently surrounded by complete strangers and expected to be 100 percent vulnerable right and open up to this. So, and I think this piece in particular, it's kind of hard not to let that happen. Because yeah. it just it just gets to the essence of what it is. Yeah, and, and uh, is that something that you have experienced in your life, the essence of what it is when it comes to feeling? <laughs> it, and if so, is there is there anything in particular that you've experienced that has led you to doing what you do today that's influenced the way that you think? Yeah, I um, I think I was pretty weird when I was little. Like, I'm not like anyone in my family. I mean, I decided to play cello, right? Um, and I was into a bunch of different things, and um, I just always felt kind of alone and outside. And um, pretty early on, I realized that like that's okay. But what wasn't okay was if I was around people that felt the same and I wasn't doing anything about it. Um, and the th times that I felt like that essence, I guess, is when I can be there for someone else that I can feel is alone or just need someone. Yeah. You're bringing up some very powerful things here. K keep going. Yeah. And you know, um, I, I've only experienced that playing a couple of times. Um, but it's been so special that like, I'm still doing it, you know, but it doesn't happen all the time. You're helping me understand something in in regards to my relationship to music. I'm not one who listens to music for the sake of listening to it. It's not playing in the background. Because when it's just playing in the background, to me it becomes noise. I just realized that the only time that I listen to music, which is frequent, but not all the time, 
is when I need to be in relationship to the music. I need to have company. And it can support me in my thinking. It can support me in my feeling, processing feelings. It can support me in different ways. And there's something about classical music that seems to be the closest to what is happening internally manifested in the form of sound that sounds like it feels. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I just it just clicked for me right now. And that's pretty pretty special. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of the music we listen to today is focused on one feeling or affect, right? But a lot of these classical works through those 30 minutes, it'll take you through a whole spectrum, right? So you have that opportunity to feel the entirety of, of something. Um, whereas, you know, most music is focused on one, one idea, you know? Um, and it's, it's funny you bring that up about listening to music because I tend not to listen to music unless it's noise, which would be like EDM or just like house music because it is noise, you know? And it allows me to not go there. So it's, 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 yeah, it's pretty cool that different musics have these different abilities to do things within us. So, uh, your first piece, you kind of had us closer to modern day, and then you took us back. And, and I assume this, this piece that you just played was, was later. It was of course uh, after Bach. Um, what are you going to play uh, now for us as a, your final piece? I'll be playing, it's called Salute d'Amour by Edward Elgar. And it's just a happy piece. And I feel like we're allowed to be happy a lot. So <laughs> I just wanted to play something light and, I don't know, pretty contrasting in the feeling. Fantastic. Take it away, my friend. <laughs> Abe, my friend, this was wonderful. Thank you for, for making it happen. 
how how are you feeling after this? I love playing these. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> I can tell. I can tell, and I and I love that you love playing music, and it's a uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to witness that. And I and I hope people who are listening can can pick up on that feeling to some degree. You know, I got several visuals in my head as you were you were playing. One of them was you know people sometimes listen to this on their commute to work, and. I had this visual of somebody being moved by a piece that they had potentially never heard before and then had this urge to to want to go look up more and learn more. And I don't know if that's part of your message, but for me that feels important. I don't know how to describe it better than than that. You you kind of open something up for me that I, I didn't know I, I needed to to open and I, I hope it can do that for for other people what what's what's the message um, what are you here to tell people through your music and through just your unique expression in this world um I guess I'll start with the specific and then get a little bit more big picture I think first off is we don't really have spaces now where we're allowed to just sit and be for a little bit. And I think because classical music has been so intellectualized and commercialized and we associate it with so many things, we've lost a really valuable thing that allows us to be in community, to be reminded that, you know, it's not weird to feel bad. It's not weird to feel sad. It's, it's, you don't have to be on all the time. Like, Everyone experiences this. And I think classical music is one of the art forms where that's that's really, really apparent if you just allow yourself to sit and be there. Um, you know, part of the reason I picked four pretty different pieces is because we call anything that's on instruments classical music, but that's 400 years of musical history. And, you know, maybe you don't like 40, 50 minute symphonies, but you like short little two minute pieces and that's fine too. Maybe you go to a concert and you don't like some of the pieces, that's okay. Um, it's, it's not an intellectual exercise. It's just about finding out what you like, what you feel, what you want more of. Um, yeah. And I guess my big picture thing is not to dismiss the things that scare us. That's a big lesson that I just learned too, doing this today. Um, you know, it's, it is weird to kind of go out and listen to classical music because of everything we associate with it, but maybe there's something there. It's interesting, and 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 my 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 curiosity, and I don't have an answer to this. Maybe you do, you do, but I'm I'm curious as to how uh, classical can continue to integrate into the contemporary, into the modern, into the future. Uh, what that would look like, if you have an idea, I would love to hear. But um, um, yeah, I don't actually even need an answer. It's just a curiosity that I have. Yeah, I I, I you know the more we've been talking, the more I've given some thought to it. And I think a big thing is we got to get rid of the stage. I, I I really think that it's become kind of this religious thing where we look at these composers and these musicians and this music as something so high and mighty, but it's it's not. It's human. It's the whole point of it is is to get away from that. You know, that's what all these composers were trying to do was get away from it. Yeah, they had to play for arist aristocracy because it was the people that you know funded them, but that wasn't what they were trying to get at. So I think a big thing is getting rid of the stage and bringing music to more intimate dialogues where the, you know, the audience gets to ask questions and if they like something, they get to hear it again. If they don't like something, we can discuss, hey, this isn't a vein of music that you don't like and hey, maybe you don't like it because there's some things here that we're not used to. And just opening the conversation up again. You know, even the conversation with composers, like this music wasn't written in a vacuum. It was written in community. You know, people listened and played it and said, hey, why don't you do this here? And we've lost that. So I think having a dialogue along with the music is how we bring it back. Yeah, well said. I, I, I totally agree. And maybe that's a little bit of what we, we got to do here today. And, and if this sparks something uh, for you, for me in the future, or for anybody listening, yeah, make make a move on it. That's my call to action. Make a move on it. And I'm I'm so thankful that you decided to make a move on this and to share this time with me. 
I learned a ton. I've been moved. I felt a lot. I can't wait to listen back. I'm like, can we end this already so I can go and like l- listen back? It's a strange feeling. Like I want to go listen back. And it's it's very um, cool uh, to feel like we did something together in community and you could share your skill set in a way that I know has now been recorded in myself in more than words. Very special. So thank you for that. Um, Any final words, anything uh, you would like to share before we uh, say farewell? Yeah, just thank you so much. Yeah, this is really special. Amazing. Yeah, thank you. This has been amazing. Thank you.